9-11 gave President Bush the opportunity to achieve his long-term goal of overthrowing Saddam Hussein, erroneously associating him with Al-Qaeda. This is a regime that has something to hide from the civilized world. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil, arming to threaten the peace of the world. And what Curveball was saying now seemed too good to dismiss. To the White House, Curveball underpinned their case. But doubts were growing. In the spring of 2002, MI6 sent the CIA a cable summing up its position on Curveball. Elements of his behavior strike us as typical of individuals we would normally assess as fabricators. But nevertheless, it was inclined to believe that a significant part of Curveball's reporting is true. I believe there were doubts in MI6 about this case from the beginning. And there was a debate, as there was in our service, and I think they couldn't verify it. They didn't have any additional information. Kerbal is saying, I was first-hand witness to the production of the biological agents. I saw accidents where people died, and, and I saw, you know, railroad cars full of stuff, and I saw the trucks. And he was in very detailed, some of it quite detailed, and, you know, the types of pumps and valves. And the key point of this is that he was telling information that people wanted to hear. Despite all the reservations, both MI6 and the CIA decided to stick with Curveball, and they soon had what they thought was corroboration. An Iraqi major who defected confirmed that Iraq has mobile biological research laboratories. This was the second spy who fooled the world an Iraqi defector from Saddam's intelligence service who made his way to Jordan. His name was Major Mohammed Harith. He offered himself to an exile group known as the Iraqi National Congress, or INC. Major Mohammed Harith was uh, an Iraqi defector that the INC located in Jordan, Amman. Uh, he was quite desperate to get out of Jordan. Nabil Moussaoui was filmed by American television talking to Major Harith. Harith said it was his idea to develop mobile biological laboratories. He said he'd bought Renault trucks and revealed how many. Seven. But the Americans had doubts because his story was so elaborate and unbelievable. He even claimed he'd met Osama bin Laden. Major Harith was given a lie detector test. But, perhaps surprisingly, he passed. When he talked about the mobile unit, yeah, I did believe him, actually. Was his story true? Uh, it proven post-2003, no. Fabricated? Fabricated. So why did he fabricate? There was, there was no proof. Why did he fabricate such a story? I think he wanted to find a new home. In the end, neither the Pentagon nor the CIA was convinced. And in spring 2002, a burn notice was issued saying that Major Harith was a fabricator. The Americans realized that Major Mohammed Harith was making it all up. He was a fabricator. Yeah, Yet his intelligence was still Used. quoted. Yes. By Same with Kerbal. Inexplicably, as with Curveball, Major Harith's intelligence would remain on file, waiting to come back and bite. Now there was to be a third attempt to fool the world, based on the nightmare scenario that Saddam could be developing a nuclear weapon. Saddam Hussein is determined to get his hands on a nuclear bomb. Once again, the story starts with a tantalizing kernel of truth, this time in Rome. 
1999, a genuine secret letter came to light indicating that an Iraqi ambassador was planning to visit Niger, a country rich in uranium. But soon the fact turned to fantasy. The fantasy revolves around this man, Rocco Martino, who over the years had had dealings with the Italian and other intelligence agencies. In this surveillance picture, he's meeting an intelligence officer. He, he liked to, to be a charming man. He was very mysterious. Uh, and um, there was a, something uh, shadowy um, around him, a part of it. And, uh, this... Rocco Martino gave Elisabetta Berber a set of documents, which she later gave to the American embassy. Potentially, they were the smoking gun that everybody in that time was looking for. It's a murky story. What is clear is that Rocco Martino got the documents from the embassy of Niger in Rome, and an Italian intelligence officer was involved at some stage. The sensational documents detailed how Iraq was planning to buy 500 tons of pure uranium from Niger and were signed and sealed by the president of Niger. The documents looked authentic and they even included the original genuine letter. But on a closer examination, they soon turned out to be a crude forgery. So they were filled with all kinds of mistakes and holes, and they used the name of a previous Minister of Foreign Affairs, a Minister of Foreign Affairs from a previous regime. The seals of the, of the Nigerian government were all hand-drawn. So it was a pretty bad forgery. Earlier on, Martino had tried to sell the documents to French intelligence, but they refused to take the bait. We were highly skeptical. We didn't even mention them to any friendly services. And most important of all, we didn't trace any acquisition uh, of uranium by Iraq during the whole period. French intelligence officers were twice dispatched to Niger's uranium mines to check it out. They reported there was nothing to it. Rochon likens the spread of the documents to a contagion. It was disseminated to some intelligence services, including France, Germany, UK. Then it crossed the Atlantic, and uh, in the end, uh, only the US and the UK uh, made that public. Because probably the immune system was weaker. The White House eagerly seized on the intelligence. Once again, it was exactly what they wanted to hear. The CIA had its reservations, but the Niger story just kept on turning up. My agency tried repeatedly to bang down that whole issue over and over and over again. But it just, one of my colleagues referred to it as whack-a-mole. You'd hit it over the head and it would go away and then it would pop back up again at another spot. We contacted Rocco Martino via his family, but they said he was too ill to do an interview or comment. He's always denied knowing the documents were forgeries. The exact role of Italian intelligence in this story is unclear, but they deny any involvement. The journalist who inadvertently fueled the circulation of the forgeries feels guilty. Personally, I feel uh, very bad because uh, I have been used uh, to justify a war which ended up uh, with uh, thousand or hundred of thousand of uh, deaths. MI6 stood by the Niger story, not based on the forged documents, but on British intelligence, including eavesdropping from here at GCHQ. 
The current British inquiry into the intelligence failings chaired by Sir John Chilcott is now into its fourth year. Behind its closed doors, one senior MI6 officer was distinctly underwhelmed by the intelligence on Niger. The Niger uranium thing was pretty unfortunate, really. If desk officers in the service had had their way, probably would never have seen the light of day. The late Brian Jones, who was head of the WMD section at Defence Intelligence, was equally dismissive. There was no suggestion in intelligence that Saddam was close to having a nuclear weapon. Although we knew that he, he'd sought nuclear weapons, there was never any suggestion that, that he had acquired them or indeed was, um, was very close to, to acquiring them. Saddam's alleged attempt to buy uranium from Niger remained on intelligence files in Washington and London, just like curveballs and major hareeths. Now the spies who fooled the world had sowed the seeds for the biggest intelligence failure in living memory. Politically, events were now moving fast. Eleven months before the war, Tony Blair met President Bush at his ranch in Crawford, Texas. Blair agreed to support regime change, but only if the UN route had been exhausted. Sir Richard Dearlove, the head of MI6, briefed the Prime Minister on his visit to Washington in July. He's reported as saying, Military action was now seen as inevitable. The intelligence and facts were being fixed around the policy. In our view, we thought that intelligence was used to justify a war which was a war of choice, of pure choice. But the intelligence was used to disguise that as a war of necessity. Tony Blair's chief of staff, Jonathan Powell, had warned that public opinion was fragile and the government now needed a Rolls-Royce information campaign. A last call went out for any further intelligence that could be presented in a dossier designed to be made public. With the publication deadline approaching, three pieces of crucial new intelligence came into MI6. Uncertainty became certainty. Saddam Hussein was now judged to have active chemical and biological weapons. The most dramatic new intelligence was the warning that the WMD could be launched within 45 minutes. He has existing and active military plans for the use of chemical and biological weapons which could be activated within 45 minutes. So where did this intelligence come from? We've established that it is likely to have been conveyed by the exiled Iraqi opposition group, the INA, based in Jordan. Its founder headed a military committee with secret cells of dissident army officers inside Iraq. This was uh, all based on very uh, tight-knit uh, connections through relatives to avoid the security of, of Saddam. And we had cells and various units, and information used to be passed to us. Dr. Alawi's group was first told about the 45-minute warning when it was planning a coup in the mid-90s and feared Saddam would use WMD against defecting soldiers.